Welcome back, guys. Um, today we are going to be talking about our last uh, major classification of biomolecules, lipids. Um, this is found in Chapter 9 of Voigt, Voigt and Pratt's um, biochemistry textbook. Um, today we'll be covering mostly just Sections 1, 2, and 3 in this textbook, which cover lipid classification, lipid bilayers, and membrane proteins. So um, for additional information, please check out the Lipid Maps Project. Um, from This is a great resource. It's an NSF grant-funded project to kind of bring together a bunch of different resources, tutorials, and studies involving all types of lipids. Um, the company that I used to work for between graduate and undergrad school of antipolar lipids was actually heavily active um, in this grant project as well. And some of the materials and standards that I developed were used um, in some of the studies discussed in the Lipid Maps project. So it's sort of a neat, um, close to home subject for me. Okay, so um, our learning objectives for this chapter are given here in this slide. Um, again, you can pause, print, read over these before we delve deeper into the material to kind of give you an idea of what to be thinking about while I'm talking and while you are reading the chapter material. Give you a second to do that. Okay, and now we are back. So lipids is a very broad class of molecules. Basically, it is any molecule that has low solubility in water and high sol solubility in nonpolar solvents. Um, lipids, unlike the other molecules, biomolecules that we've talked about, um, do not actually form polymers in the sense that the monomers covalently link, such as um, nucleic acids or nucleotides, will covalently link um, in order to form a polymer such as DNA or RNA, or if we look at proteins, you know, we see amino acids covalently linked to form um, proteins, or we see in carbohydrates, monosaccharides will covalently link in order to form polysaccharides. Lipids, instead, aggregate due to the hydrophobic effect to form their non-covalently linked polymers such as the lipid bilayers or micelles, okay? So there's two categories for lipids. You can have complex lipids um, which contain fatty acids and we'll talk about what those are in just a minute or simple lipids that don't contain fatty acids. Now lipids serve in a lot of different functions in the cell. Um, they are the main source of energy storage in animals, um, specifically in adipose tissue. They also serve in structure. Um, they form the membranes of the eukaryotic cells. And they also can form in cell-to-cell -cell signaling, cofactors to activate proteins or enzymatic reactions, as well as pigments in a lot of plants. Um, we also can see hormones and vitamins are formed from lipids. So what are fatty acids? Well, fatty acids are long hydrocarbon chains that have a carboxylic head group. So here we can see our carboxylic head group with our carbon-hydrogen chain. Now these can either be saturated, meaning they have all single bonds as we see here, or they can be unsaturated, meaning we have some double bonds as we can see here. Okay? The melting point of saturated fatty acids increases while length increases, so the longer the fatty acid is, the higher the melting temp will be. However, as you introduce double bonds, um, as we see in unsaturated fatty acids, the more double bonds you have, the lower the melting point is. So you kind of have a give and take with fatty acid length versus the degree of unsaturation. Um, the term saturation means that your carbons are fully saturated with hydrogens where unsaturated means your carbons have removed two hydro or one hydrogen through the double bond formation. Now, fatty acids are named based on their length. So if we look at 12O, that means we have 12 
carbons with zero double bonds. Um, that is the symbol name. That's the one I really want you to be able to know. Um, they do have a common name, lauric acid for a 12O, and a systemic name, dodeca dodecanoic acid. But really, um, for the purposes of this class, just understanding what the symbol name means will be able to help you out. Um, now, once we start introducing, now this is pretty simple, right? We can say, all right, there's 14 carbons, no double bonds. But when we start introducing double bonds, how does the systemic name tell us how many double bonds there are and where do the double bonds occur? So for instance, let's look at this fatty acid, okay? We have our alpha carbon, which is our first carbon after the carboxylic carbon. And we have our omega carbon, which is the carbon at the end. Now for this fatty acid, we have 18 carbons total, counting the carboxylic carbon. So this would be a 18. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4 double bonds. Now the first double bond occurs 1, 2, three carbons from the omega end. So we say that that is an N minus three. All right, so that would be your systemic name for this fatty acid, an 18,4 N minus three, meaning the first double bond occurs between the third and the fourth carbon from the omega end. Now the rest of the double bonds are going to occur every third carbon. So one, two, three. We'll have another double bond. One, two, three. Another double bond. One, two, three. Another double bond. This means that the double bonds in the fatty acids are not conjugated because we're not at every other carbon. We're at every third carbon. And in nature, all of our double bonds, as you can see here, are in the cis configuration, right? So cis means that the hydrogens are coming off of the same face versus trans, where the hydrogens are coming off in opposite faces of the double bond. And this plays a big role that we'll see later on. All right, so now if I look at, say, a 16-1, N minus 7. This means that I have a 16 long carbon hydrogen chain, including the carboxylic carbon, with one double bond, and that one double bond is between the seventh and the eighth carbon from the omega end. Okay? Now you can figure that out for the rest of these, okay? Now, Let's talk a little bit about the importance between the cis and the trans. So as I told you, in nature, we see predominantly the cis orientation. So our fatty acids end up with these kinks at every cis double bond. Now, synthetically, when we're deriving um, oils or fats, um, we tend to derive in the lab trans. And the trans will behave much like these saturated fatty acids in that the trans configuration will allow, um, you do not have kinks, so it's more of a straight uh, fatty acid chain. Now what happens is when you get a number of these trans fats together, they can aggregate very closely and pack very closely together. And what this does is this increases the melting temperature. So that, oh, I'm sorry, this decreases the melting temperature. So that these will be solids at room temperature and possibly even body temperature. And this can cause issues um, with heart disease and plaque buildup in our capillaries with if you have a lot of trans fatty acids. And that's why um, a lot of the nutritionists and um, health care policies are pushing towards reducing the use of trans fatty acids and increasing more of the use of um, cis or naturally occurring fatty acids um, such as the acids you'll see in olive oil because these are naturally derived 
fatty acids versus something in Crisco, which is synthetically made. Um, the cis, the kink in these fatty acids inhibits this close-to-close um, -close aggregation, which then allows these to be more liquids or oils at room temperature and even possibly at body temperature so that you do not get plaque buildup in your capillaries from these oils aggregating and solidifying um, in your around your heart or capillaries or, or, or veins uh, so on and so forth okay so fatty acids can then bind or become esterified to glycerol in order to make triacylglycerols or also sometimes called triglycerides. I tend to call them triglycerides. So uh, here is your glycerol molecule and what happens is you get esterification of um, various fatty acids. You can have all different fatty acids as each of your carbons. You can have two of the same and one different or you can have all three are the same. Um, just based on what gets esterified onto the glycerol. This um, triglycerides are your primary source of energy reserves in animals. Um, they're usually found in um, adipocytes, which make up adipose tissue or that fat layer tissue um, under your skin, um, which is very important in aquamarine animals. Um, like whales or seals that live under very cold temperatures, um, the adipose tissue, one, gives them an energy reserve, as well as two, provides heat protection and insulation. Um, the fatty acids of triglycerides are less oxidized than both carbohydrates and proteins, and so therefore they yield about six times more the metabolic energy upon oxidation, which we'll find out when we talk about glycolysis and then um, here we can get the differentiation between fats, which are solid at room temperature. Again, um, saturated fatty acids or trans fatty acids are more likely to be solid at room temperature because they can pack more closely together versus the oils, which are liquid at room temperature. And those are the ones that usually have your cis um, fatty acids attached um, because the kinking prohibits that um, close packing thus you um, uh, decrease the melting temperature. Now, another classification of lipids is um, glycerophospholipids or just phospholipids. I tend to call them phospholipids. Um, this is what I worked with a lot when I was at um, Avanti, um, purif or not purifying, but detecting their purity and determining their, um, their um, classification. So, a glycerol 3-phosphate head group is esterified with fatty acids at the C1 and C2 of the glycerol. So here we still have our glycerol compound, which we see here. However, instead of a third fatty acid chain, we have a phosphate head group and then two fatty acid chains esterified to the other two carbons. Um, this makes these molecules amphiphilic because we have a hydrophilic phosphate head group with hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobic fatty acid tails. Um, phospholipids are therefore the major component of lipid bilayers because this phosphate head group can interact with water while the hydrophobic tails can interact with the other hydrophobic tails and due in the hydrophobic effect we can create the micelle in the lipid bilayer and through aggregation with other phospholipids, and we'll talk about that more when we talk about the, the bilayers. However, so the phosphate head group um, can actually get modified here, um, and we can have, you know, very simply just a hydrogen, which is just phosphatidic acid or PA. Um, we could have phosphatidylethylalamine functional group, which is a PE, phosphatidylcholine. PC, phosphatidylserine is PS, phosphatidyl inositol is this head group, um, would be a PI, phosphatidylglycerol has a glycerol group, PG, and then um, we can also get a diphosphatidylglycerol or cardiolipin, um, which would be DPG.
Okay? Um, I just, you don't have to memorize these. I mean, maybe recognize it. Um, but I may use this term like PC or PE um, in this lecture further on. So I just wanted you to know what I meant when I was referring to that. Now, phospholipases are enzymes that can actually cleave um, various parts of the phospholipid. Um, for instance, phospholipase A will cleave one of the fatty acid tails off, and that will make lysophospholipid. Um, lysophospholipid is often a signature of cell damage and can actually activate um, immune responses and um, cell healing or tissue healing processes. So lysophospholipid, like I said, is a signal to help induce some of these interactions. Um, you can also have phospholipase D, which will cleave that head group. So if it was a phosphatidylcholine, the choline gets cleaved. Or phospholipase C, which actually cleaves the entire phosphate. And now you would just have a diacylglycerol. What's interesting is... Um, when I worked at Avanti, we used a lot of phospholipase A to make um, phosphatidylcholine into lysophosphatidylcholine um, for customers. And the phospholipase A we got was from rattlesnake venom. So a lot of snake venom has a lot of um, phospholipases in them that can specifically cleave either one of the esters versus the other ester group, either the one or the two, if we wanted specific cleaving. Um, and it's just really easy, well, it's not easy, I mean, we can buy it, but harvesting the venom, it was very, these lipases are very rich in the venom, um, and so all you have to do is milk the snake, get the venom, and then you can use, apply that venom to your phosphatidylcholine and get um, a large amount of the lysophosphatidylcholine out. <clears throat> now, sphingolipids um, are a lot like the... Um, uh, phospholipids, except instead of a glycerol backbone, it has a sphingosine backbone on the lipids. So these are also commonly found in biological membranes. Um, a ceramide is made when you have the sphingothene group esterified with a fatty acid here. And this fatty acid gets esterified through an amide linkage. So it's a little different from the um, phospholipid in that it has a phosphoester bond. Now we have a, um, or we have an ester bond, esterification, esterification bond through oxygen as opposed to through nitrogen here on the uh, ceramide. Now we can further modify ceramide to make sphingomyelin where you add a phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidylethylalanine group to the ceramide here. <laughs> Um, cerebrosides are ceramides with a sugar head group. So instead of the PC or PE, we have a sugar. And then gangliosides are ceramides that have oligosaccharides, so more than one sugar. And it can actually get to be a pretty complicated molecule, as you can see here. Um, these play a large role in um, neuronal tissue as well as um, for myelin sheaths. You'll have a higher amount of sphingomyelin. And then also um, in brain cells and brain neurons, you have more cerebrocytes or gangliosides. Steroids are another classification of lipids. Um, they are all derivatives of this four-ring um, molecule. And we'll see, we can try to pronounce it. It's cyclo pentanoperhydrophenatherine, all right, or this molecule, <laughs> okay? So cholesterol is an example of a steroid. It is the most abundant steroid found in the body. Um, here we can see that same four-ring structure. We can see we have a hydroxyl group added into the carbon-3 of ring A, and then we also have um, this carbon-hydrogen moiety coming off on um, D carbon-17. Um, cholesterol constitutes about 30 to 40 percent of the plasma membrane, and we'll talk about why that is um, in just a second. I think that number just seems really high, but that's what it says in the textbook, and I'll double check that's, that's the right number. 
So cholesterol is often a metabolic precursor to a number of steroid hormones, such as um, glucocorticoids, cortisol, also aldosterone, which helps regulate excretion of salt and water by the kidneys, and then um, ster uh, sex hormones such as androgens and estrogens, like testosterone or estradiol. So you can see how all of them look very similar to cholesterol and that they have that same form of ring and they have either an oxygen or a hydroxyl group um, bound to the three sugar that we saw or not the three sugar but that three carbon in that A ring that we see in cholesterol. Okay. Vitamin D is also a sterol derivative. Um, active vitamin D promotes absorption of calcium um, a lot of the times we take in vitamin D in an unactivated form and it requires UV radiation to activate it um, in order to make it um, usable by the body and vitamin D once activated promotes absorption of calcium. A deficiency of vitamin D we get poor absorption of calcium and that causes rickets in children. While an overabundance, now remember this is a fat-soluble vitamin, so you can have too much. Um, it being fat-soluble and not water-soluble means our body cannot excrete the excess vitamin D. So if we have an overabundance or we have vitamin D in toxicity, um, it can increase calcium absorbance, which can then cause kidney stones. Isoprenoids are another um, classification of lipids. These are built from isoprenes, like backbones. Um, these make up pigments, um, signaling hormones, pheromones, defensive agents that can elicit immune responses, as well as other fat-soluble vitamins, such as vitamin K, A, and E. Um, vitamin K is important in blood clotting. Vitamin A, once um, modified to retinol, is vital um, for the photoreceptors or to see in low light conditions. While vitamin E gets integrated into the plasma membrane of cells as an antioxidant. So that's why um, vitamin D is always promoted as an anti-aging or wrinkle-reducing uh, molecule by producing or reducing oxidation of surface skin cells. Now, um, all lipids can aggregate together. Um, a lot of them, if they have one fatty acid tail, are more likely to aggregate into micelles. Right, which have one layer of a, you have your hydrophilic head group, maybe the glycerol, and if it just has one fatty acid tail, those fatty acid tails are going to orient themselves into the center um, that are hydrophobic, excluding water. And because of their shape, if it's only one fatty acid tail, you get a cone shape, and that's going to drive more of a micelle formation. If you see here, if we get to sort of a rectangular formation, we'll see that we'll include water in the center, which the hydrophobic tails will not like, and this is actually um, less stable and less likely to happen. However, if you end up with two tails, such as a diacylglyceride or phospholipids, um, they more likely do want to form this rectangular type shape so that you still get the exclusion of water um, in the center of the rectangular um, micelle. However, this isn't technically a bilayer because it's just one layer. So if you get more phospholipids, you end up with your bilayer, where you have an outer layer of the phospho um, head group that's hydrophilic. Right, so hydrophilic phosphate head group. Now this can also be um, the hydrophilic head group of sphingomyelins as well as the sphingosine is um, hydrophilic as well. 
Then you have your hydrophobic fatty acid tails. that orient together to make a nice little happy um, hydrophobic region that's excluding water. So water is pushed out from the middle. You'll get two layers of these. So you have one phosphate, one phospholipid orienting tail to tail with another phospholipid. And so then you end up with another layer of your hydrophilic phosphate groups that are on the inside of your um, bilayer. So this is your outside. Okay, as we can see here. So outside, inside. Now when you have um, small little pockets or vesicles of these um, that are just small circular cephalic um, bilayer, we call this a liposome. In the inside, we have whatever your solvent, usually an aqueous solvent such as water. Um, and what's interesting is people are starting to look at liposomes as modes of drug delivery. So it's, you know, we can make a lot of drugs, but we have a hard time delivering them into the body, into the cells that they need to enter in order to perform their function um, in healing whatever it is we're trying to heal utilizing the drug. Um, a lot of times it's because the drug itself cannot pass through the bilayer of the cell it's trying to enter or it may get digested digested in the digestive tract. So by incorporating the drug on the inside, let's see, with the solvent, we can then, so we'll say this is our, I'm just going to do a big triangle for our drug. So if we use these liposomes to encircle our drug, the liposomes having this lipid bilayer can then go through the bloodstream and then enter into the lipid bilayer of a cell by incorporating its bilayer into the cell's bilayer, which then releases the drug into the cell. And we can talk about this more um, in class if this is confusing to you. So, but just think about liposomes are sort of like empty little cells. Um, that have lipid membranes and they're either empty with just solvent or we can put um, some sort of drug or something that we're trying to get into other cells. Now, the lipid bilayer has fluid-like properties, right? Um, in lateral diffusion, we see that lipids, say this phospholipid, can move laterally, side to side in the bilayer very rapidly because it's sort of, you know, like I said, it's very, uh, people call it the fluid mosaic or it's fluid-like properties. However, transverse diffusion or flip-flop, so this phospholipid flip-flopping to the other side of the membrane, so if this is the outside of the cell and that's the inside of the cell, that type of translation is actually very slow because this phosphate head group is going to have to enter into the hydrophobic region and the hydrophilic tail is actually going to get exposed into the aqueous environment as well. It happens, but it happens very slowly. However, the lateral diffusion is very quickly um, because the phosphate head group does not ever have to enter into the hydrophobic, hydrophobic, hydrophobic region. Another interesting characteristic of uh, lipid bilayers is that the fluidity of the bilayer is temperature dependent. That means that at temperatures above this transition temperature, we have our liquid crystal where we have the very fluid-like movement and we get very fast side-to-side um, -side transitions, translational transitions. And our little fatty acid chains are kind of dancing around happily, and hydrophobic molecules can flow back and forth very easily. However, as we decrease the temperature, we reach this transition temperature to where we get to like a gel-like solid. And what happens is that the translational rate 
is slowed down because you cannot as easily move back and forth. It's not as fluid, and our little hydrophobic fatty acid tails are much more stationary and not moving as much, and so we end up with more like a solid. Um, this they call a liquid crystal state. Now this temperature is going to be heavily dependent on the types of lipids and the fatty acid tails um, that are in the bilayer. Again, remember the longer the fatty acid tail is for a saturated fatty acid tail, the higher your TM will be. The more um, double bonds that you have, the lower your TM will be. And then there's also um, molecules um, or other lipids that can interact in your plasma membrane, such as cholesterol. So remember I mentioned cholesterol actually is in the plasma membrane at a very high percent, either 30 to 40 percent. And what it does is it wedges itself between the phospholipids at periodic points. Now cholesterol, remember, is a very rigid ring type structure. And what that does is that's going to further decrease your TM because it's going to reduce the ability of these um, fatty acid tails to straighten out and aggregate um, in the um, gel-like solid state. <clears throat> So here we have our full plasma membrane, and we, you know, we talk about how the plasma membrane is made up of either phospholipids or sphingolipids. However, there's a ton of other molecules that are interacting or are part of the plasma membrane. Um, remember I mentioned cholesterol is a big factor. There's lots of cholesterols in the plasma membrane. That helps keep the membrane very fluid by reducing um, the melting temperature. Also, we have um, proteins that are either peripheral proteins, so they either interact with one side of the plasma membrane or another side of the plasma membrane. We also have integral or transmembrane proteins that span both the outside, the inside, and the um, the inside of the cell, outside of the cell, as well as spanning through the plasma membrane itself. These proteins can have associated with it oligosaccharides um, that can be used for cell-to-cell -cell communication, as well as um, lipid-linked proteins. A lot of these membrane proteins um, can span through the plasma membrane utilizing various secondary structures and the book discusses this in a little more detail but we can see transmembrane proteins can either have alpha helices a series of alpha helices if it passes through more than once so this would be a single pass through this would have multiple passes um, they can also utilize beta barrel rolls Oh, here we go, beta barrel rolls. And often these regions that span through the membrane are hydrophobic. Um, by using alpha helices or the beta barrels, we can, um, we can promote the hydrogen bonding within the protein itself, which helps make this more soluble in the lipid matrix. Um, while also um, enhancing, say, the hydrophobic residues may be on the outside of this barrel roll or around this alpha helix, and more hydrophilic residues may be on the inside of the barrel roll, on the inside of the helix. Um, by doing these secondary structures, we're also shielding the protein backbone, which is very hydrophilic and likes to hydrogen bond. By utilizing the hydrogen bonding within the molecule of the alpha helix itself, and again, making it more soluble in the lipid membrane. Um, you can also have peripheral proteins that only, bond, that only bind to one side of the membrane or the other. Um, lipid linked to where they're covalently, actually covalently linked to the plasma membrane. Um, here, this protein may come off and on the plasma membrane um, depending on um, cofactors or just diffusion rates. And you can also have things attached to the proteins. Remember, we could have um, oligosaccharides attached to these proteins or even maybe 
uh, nucleic acids if it's a, 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 a it recognizes that protein. It may be a cell signaling thing. Okay, uh, so here we're talking about the hydrophobic amino acid side chains would be exposed onto the lipid side, and then hydrogen bonding of the backbone within the helix um, makes it more soluble because now we're utilizing those polar groups in a hydrogen bond with the molecule itself instead of with the solvents. Membrane proteins have a number of various functions um, as far as selective transport channels. Um, if you want to pump a certain um, ion in to the cell, such as sodium or calcium, or certain ions out of the cell, such as potassium or chloride. Um, these can also act as enzymes or cell surface receptors. So let's say you have a hormone that is received by this protein that will trigger some sign of signal cascade on the inside of the cell. Also for cell surface identity, here's where a lot of times those oligosaccharides play a role. They're bound to the transmembrane protein um, in very unique branch structures that can tell um, other um, proteins or other um, cells what this is, like maybe this is specifically a lung cell versus a heart cell. We can also get cell-to-cell -cell adhesion um, through transmembrane proteins. Say this protein is a receptor for this protein, so now we've glued these two cells together. And they can also provide um, attachments for the cytoskeleton, as we can see here, to help um, provide certain cell shapes. So basically that's what I wanted to go over with you guys today in this video. Um, please read over the material, write down any questions that you may have, um, come see me in my office. Also check out um, you know some of these links that I've provided um, with the fatty acid naming. There's a really good Wikipedia article. Um, the link for that is here. Um, that you can see um, that gives you a, a much better tutorial on naming fatty acids in a little more detail. Um, and again, you know, I'm here if you need me, and I hope you enjoyed this video, and I will see you guys in class. All right, y'all have a great day.